Welcome to the ICU Management and Practice DigiConf Oxygen Therapy. Our Editor in Chief, Professor Jean Louis Vincent, will moderate the session. Our panelists include Jorn Krinzeman, Specialist in Anesthesiology, Mark Leone, Professor of Anesthesiology and Critical Care Medicine, Francesco Fafori, Professor of Anesthesia and Intensive Care. Samuela Ferrari, Medical Doctor, Department of Surgical Medical Molecular Pathology. And Vincenzo Rossotto, Anesthesiologist and Intensivist. Let us now welcome the moderator of today's Digicomp, Jean-Louis Vincent. being with us to this uh, interesting discussion on oxygen therapy. Everything we need to know about oxygen therapy. And hopefully the participants have already been introduced, so that will facilitate my task. I realize that there are only men uh, at this session. We had one or two women, but unfortunately, uh, with, uh, with one or two cancellations, we are only among uh, uh, male participants uh, today. Nevertheless, uh, I'm sure that we will have the opportunity to, to cover many aspects and perhaps we will uh, start right away with, uh, with, with uh, John Grenzmann from Hamburg, who will introduce the topic of uh, oxygen therapy. So, John, thank you. Well, thank you for the kind uh, invitation uh, to this uh, webinar and the introduction. Um, it is probably impossible to, to show the rationale for um, all the recommendations given in just five to 10 minutes, and I'll just give a few examples. But before we start, uh, we need not to forget that we all, and this is not just my conflict of interest, need oxygen to live. We cannot live without oxygen. But what is the problem when um, rationing oxygen to our patients? And um, we have to, to bear in mind that above a partial pressure of 80, uh, pretty much uh, hemoglobin is saturated with oxygen and um, at a saturation of 96%. So um, above that, only very little oxygen is additionally bound to, to hemoglobin. But what is the problem of higher partial pressures? Um, reactive oxygen species are formed, especially with exogenous and endogenous uh, factors uh, like um, peroxisomes or uh, microbes and toxins, and the cell integrity is disturbed, leading to um, apoptosis or even necrosis. And the resulting inflammation leads to a vicious cycle, further increasing the ROS, uh, the reactive oxygen species formation. And uh, we know from uh, now fairly old retrospective data that in intensive care patients, um, the optimum range may be in the range of 70 to 80 millimeters of mercury. And one of the first studies um, challenging this uh, was from, from Italy. Um, although this study has some limitations, it was the first hint that um, conservative oxygen therapy, thus rationalizing oxygen uh, application, may reduce the mortality. Um, on the other hand, a very recent study from France um, could show that a liberal oxygen ther therapy may be associated uh, with a decreased mortality. But this was a secondary outcome measure and the study has some uh, limitations. It was prematurely stopped after just a quarter of the planned patients. And those patients were uh, in moderate or severe ARDS uh, with a, a mean um, inspiratory fraction of oxygen of 80%. And those patients did not re receive a pre-oxygenation. And I presume that this may have led to the the um, increased mortality in the conservative oxygen group. And the primary outcome measure, there was no difference. And uh, from this year, um, 
a larger study also including uh, severe ARDS uh, patients with nearly 3,000 patients aiming to compare 60 to 90 millimeters of mercury. They actually uh, compared 71 to uh, 93 per, um, millimeters of mercury found no difference between the groups. The study has some limitations as well, as it may have been statistically at least uh, slightly underpowered as the mortality was higher than anticipated. This is just to give a few examples um, how the um, current recommendations um, arose. And just a few days ago, the new German guideline on oxygen management was released and uh, recommends a target of 92 to 96 percent in cases of patients without a risk for hypercarbia for acute exacerbated uh, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, uh, the British British uh, Thoracic Society and the German Society both recommend 88 to 92 percent. Now there are um, recommendations for um, distinct uh, diseases like myocardial infarction in uh, STEMI and non-STEMI uh, from Europe and, and the US and both recommend no oxygen administration um, above a saturation of 90%. For cardiogenic shock, it's a little bit higher, 94 to 98%. Uh, Post resuscitation, the same. Um, for stroke, at least 94%. Uh, carbon monoxide poisoning. This is probably one of the only uh, disease entities where you need 100% oxygen until the um, CO hemoglobin is below 3% or the patient is uh, free of symptoms. And hyperbaric oxygen may be considered um, if the CO uh, hemoglobin is uh, above 25 to 30 percent. Now, I think this is uh, often hard to remember all those uh, those target uh, ranges in the um, clinical practice. Um, but we have to uh, remember that hyperoxia has no proven benefit and may increase morbidity and mortality, and we need a targeted application of oxygen, but the optimum targets are still unknown. And um, what I think uh, is practical in, in the hospital is uh, to target a, a saturation of oxygen between 92 and 96 percent for patients without a risk for hypercarbia and 88 to 92 percent in cases of a risk for hypercarbia like uh, acute exacerbated uh, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Um, it's, a, it's a nice introduction to the, the topic. Uh, if there are questions, please feel free to write them in the uh, chat um, column or in the um, Q&A column. But at this stage, I think it would be better to go on and invite uh, Professor Marc Leone to tell us more about the harmful effect of excessive oxygen administration. Too much oxygen is bad, Mark. Thank you, Jean-Louis. Uh... I'm going to share my screen. Uh, so it's fine for you. Uh, so uh, to, to, we are going to, to talk about the benefits and arms of oxygen and, and too much oxygen is bad. Uh, I like this figure. It's my favorite figure in, in, in medicine uh, that show you that uh, we have in the air uh, 150 millimeter G of uh, PO2, and to make my my uh, uh, mitochondria uh, active, I need only few millimeter of oxygen, uh, and this is at the level of the sea, and this uh, like this uh, uh, oxygen is just life, and that's only what I can do for my patient with, with hypoxemia. However, uh, hypoxia is, is quite natural response. And uh, for example, for Hélène, we are very proud in France from Hélène, uh, who is the uh, youngest uh, female uh, climbing uh, on Everest uh, last month. Uh, 
if you climb on Everest, you, you are hypoxemic. Uh, and this is a natural response. Uh, by contrast, if you want to see in the natural uh, hyperoxia, that's not natural. And you always need a supplemental oxygen uh, and a human intervention. Uh, so never, never you can find hyperoxia in the natural. That's not a natural response. Hyperoxia is, is very toxic and there is a direct pulmonary toxicity and uh, the denitrogenation can create atelectasis when you use FO2 that can induce uh, hypercamnia, that can induce proliferative retinopathy, that can that's toxic for, for, for the brain. And there is uh, the, the, the generation of reactive oxygen species, which are uh, deleterious for, for tissues, creating apoptosis and inflammation. So hyperoxia is very toxic and oxygen at high level is toxic. If I ask you if you control very well the, the, the oxygen delivery, in your patient and uh, and the the the, the uh, number of patients with hyperoxia in your unit probably you 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 don't tell me the, the truth but in in practice that's that's been uh, that has been uh, assessed in this uh, exploratory study uh, and uh, Duan collaborator found that 46 percent of patients uh, and that's a large uh, database of patients 46 percent uh, were hyperoxic and hyperoxia was defined by an HIO2 above the 96 percent so that, that's a huge number of patients. Hyperoxia and outcome, it's, uh, hyperoxia is bad for outcome. And uh, when you have study comparing, uh, comparing normoxia and hyperoxia, and I, I show you here a meta-analysis, uh, there is a, a very strong uh, signal uh, favoring normoxia as compared with, with hyperoxia. The most representative study, and that has been shown by, by, by uh, Yuan previously, is uh, the, the, it's this Italian study, oxygen therapy, with uh, comparing conservative versus conventional oxygen therapy. And which is interesting is, is that more than 30% uh, of patients, around 40%, had PA2 above uh, 124. Uh, so that, that's really a liberal mode with high uh, PaO2. And in this study, there is an increased mortality in the patient with, uh, with liberal uh, use of oxygen. But there is some conflicting results, uh, which has been published recently. And there is three uh, randomized controlled trial. Uh, there is a rock, uh, the ICU rocks by, by the, the Australian and New Zealand uh, groups. There is a the French study comparing the liberal or conservative oxygen in IRDS and a Scandinavian study. And all these studies were negative. And in fact, in this study, when, it, when you look at the study, which is important is, is the difference between the intervention group and the control group. And in this study, uh, if you have a, a liberal group, a, a control group, which is really liberal, like in the Gerardis uh, study with uh, IPO2, there is an effect. But if your control group has a very uh, limited uh, amount of oxygen with a PO2 between 90 and, and one, one, 100, like in, in the ICU rocks or, or in the French study, uh, probably there is no effect because you compare a conservative strategy and an ultra conservative strategy somewhere. And, and this is not the, the, the goal. There is also conflicting results 
coming from observation as studies, and, and we, are, we have to be very uh, prudent with observation as studies, uh, that's just a basis for, 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 for future randomized clinical trial. But uh, in all these uh, randomized, in all these observation as studies that was trauma patient, uh, chest trauma or, or severe trauma or traumatic brain injury, and the, the, the management of patient with oxygen was at the, at the onset of the management during the first hours. So perhaps in the patient with severe shock, with severe bleeding, uh, with severe uh, traumatic injuries uh, in the early hour, but only in the early hour, uh, there is something to, to, to assess and we need more data about that. I, I'm very not sure that these results are very uh, uh, conclusive, but uh, I think they, they, there is some room for improvement for, for this patient. So uh, my take home message, hyperoxia is a silent killer and, and we, we should be very uh, uh, pay attention to, to this. Uh, there is there is a question for me for the short and and uh, early management of uh, oxygen therapy in specific patient, especially patients with trauma, uh, but that just at the beginning of, of the of the management, and uh, just remember the U curve, uh, the U curve with with hypoxia which is uh, a killer and hyperosia, which is also a killer. And the, the good target is, is probably uh, between 70 and 110. Thank you for your, for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Marc. Uh, that was uh, also a very nice uh, overview. Uh, to avoid uh, any uh, confusion, I think it's important to uh, separate hypoxemia and tissue hypoxia because, um, of course, the PO2 can be low, what we call hypoxemia, and yet the tissues may still be relatively happy uh, without increase in lactate levels that would reflect the presence of tissue hypoxia. So we have not pronounced the word of calic output, oxygen delivery, but for the tissues at the end, it is the oxygen delivery that counts, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah, I agree. So thank you. Let's um, let's move on because otherwise, I'm sure we will return to COVID nineteen specifically. So let's now uh, listen to um, to Francesco uh, Forfori and Samuele Ferrari, who will uh, discuss the oxygen therapy in uh, COVID-19 before we uh, move uh, to the discussion. Let's move on. So please, uh, these are uh, friends from, uh, from PISA and we are looking forward to their discussion. Francesco, we start. Yes, Th thank you very much for, for the invitation on the behalf of all the staff in our department. Uh, as we have learned, uh, oxygen is a drug and we should uh, treat it as a drug. What is it? Oh, sorry. The slide. Okay. We should uh, consider that uh, we have some targets uh, that need to be followed. We have to know the physiology. We have to know the limit of the tool we are using to assess uh, the status of the patient. But what is important is that we have to personalize the therapy for each single patient. And this is what we did in, in PISA as we assess oxygen therapy in COVID patient, uh, testing high CO2, then high flow, and then uh, lung recruitment in a step-by-step -step, uh, approach. Uh, we know that uh, rising, uh, sorry, we know that rising uh, uh, CO2 uh, probably is useful in treating uh, ventilation perfusion uh, mismatch, but uh, doesn't work if the patient has uh, a moderate or severe chance. So we have to assess uh, which patient require uh, 
uh, only IFO2 compared to the other one, which require a more invasive uh, ventilatory uh, support. And uh, we know that uh, high flow may be applied early in the stage of the disease. Uh, probably it will help in reducing intubation rates and in preventing respiratory escalation. Uh, there are at the moment no study on uh, mortality, and so we, we probably require more, uh, more data about that. We also know that the high flow matched with the peak inspiratory flow of the patient. Very important, uh, we can uh, give to the patient, administer to the patient an accurate CO2. Uh, Sometimes when the patient is breathing oxygen in venti mask, uh, if the respiratory rate is, is very high, it dilutes oxygen. So the real CO2 is not uh, what we, we, we want. We know also that uh, eye flow uh, reduce uh, uh, dead space of the airways and uh, probably increase the CO2 washout. And there is also a bit increase in uh, lung respiratory volume. So uh, 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 what we do uh, if eye flow uh, is not uh, sufficient is a further uh, increase in uh, ventilatory suspost. And the use of CPAP uh, probably includes the benefit of giving an ag flow of gas with the, a constant and accurate uh, CO2 and uh, the possibility of recruit the lung with, uh, with PIP. Uh, CPAP may be applied in different settings. And this is very important when you have to, you have to, to use uh, an, an important number of, uh, of patients. Uh, what is important is that CPAP does not increase GT, and this is very important in probably preventing the self-induced uh, lung injury generated by other form of invas invasive or invasive ventilation. And we know that CPAP improves oxygenation and uh, release uh, the dyspnea of, uh, of the patient. What is in... Sorry, okay. What, what is important to consider is also that CPAP reduce uh, shunt, improve uh, ventilatory perfusion, uh, prevents intubation, and uh, it, uh, it's very important because uh, we can modulate PIP value according to the, to the stage of disease. We know that uh, in the early phase of the disease, probably the patient does not require a high value of PIP, but in later on, the value may be, may be increased. And uh, sometimes in selected patient, when uh, uh, adequate resources were available, a small number, number of patients were closely monitoring and the PSV was applied, may be applied as a, a last step in, uh, in uh, non-invasive ventilation before, before intubation. What we have to consider when we use PSV is that uh, patient may develop a, an important uh, transpulmonary pressure and so uh, may be exposed to a higher risk of uh, self-induced lung injury. And we also have considered that uh, at the moment the uh, CPAP performed with the helmet has a less mortality of uh, PSV performance with the helmet. So we have to consider PSV as a, a double, uh, double uh, sword uh, uh, weapon and pay attention because uh, PSV uh, may uh, uh, induce in the patient uh, a, a, a tidal volume higher than uh, what we like may increase the incidence of uh, asynchronous and uh, so may worsen the, the physiology of, of, of our patient. And uh, we have to, to pay attention that uh, PSV may prolong uh, ventilation and so may retard the intubation of, uh, of the patient. So what, 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 what is important to consider is a step-by-step -step approach that was used to increase the, the support from mini-invasive to 
completely, totally invasive, like uh, ECMO in the uh, late uh, phases of, of disease. And uh, it, it, it's very important that uh, we can use different uh, tools to help in our decision. Uh, not only the clinical assessment of the patient that at the moment remain the most important uh, aspect we have to consider, but we can also use chest ultrasound. Probably we can use uh, the ultrasound of the diaphragm. Uh, we can uh, use uh, uh, different uh, value or different school just to try to uh, create, to adapt the right treatment for the right patient. And this is uh, at the moment uh, very, very, very difficult because there are no studies on the benefit of early versus late uh, intubation or the no studies that have a significant uh, data on the non-invasive versus invasive ventilation. So probably we have to consider that more data are required. But I think that also in this field, the less uh, uh, is, uh, is, uh, is more. So we shall try to prevent uh, intubation in, uh, in this type of patient. And I thank you for the invitation again. Thank you. Yeah, 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 yeah. We saw your foot, your football team uh, after this. Thank you very, very much. Uh, very nice presentation, and uh, indeed uh, to make the transition before the fourth uh, talk on uh, peri intubation problems. Uh, someone asks the question. Um, when should we intubate the patient? You said we do not have enough data to recommend early versus late intubation, but at the same time, you mentioned that we should individualize, personalize our therapies. So I'm not so sure that a big randomized control trial will help very much in this, in this setting. But the important question is, now that we have high flow ventilation, we have uh, high flow oxygen therapy, I should say. Uh, we have the helmet, we have the CPAP systems. Um, are the indications for endotracheal intubation different than before, Francesco? Yes, you are, you are perfectly agree. I think that uh, it's, uh, at the moment, it's difficult to say when or intubate or not intubate, except for a very, very severe patient with uh, severe dyspnea or severe hypoxemic uh, condition in which uh, uh, you, you, it, it's quite easy to put the tube. I think that uh, it's very important to tailor the, the therapy on the patient, knowing the patient, knowing the physiology, and uh, uh, knowing which instrument we can use on the patient. Because if uh, I cannot follow the patient because there are too many patients or the patients are in different setting, uh, probably it, it, it would be better to do the safest thing for the patient. That is not uh, the right thing. This is not always the, the right thing. So the question is very, it's very difficult. I think that it's very important to put uh, when you can to put a continuous eyes on 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 your patient so that you can you can uh, you can visualize the, the small change the small change in uh, work or breathing the small change so, to, so a, a small change in your target so that you can see okay i'm doing the right thing or probably i have to change my strategies so uh, yeah so what you suggest is that the trend uh, should be taken into account, and this is indeed uh, very, very important. Now, um, Samuele, would you like to add something? No, I think the professor has uh, done a very good job of explaining uh, and presenting the data that was yeah. also done in the article. Because in, in, in a prospective randomized control trial, of uh, early versus late endotracheal intubation, one can suspect that in the group, um, in the late uh, 
on the tracheal intubation, uh, we could find out that some patients could do without on the tracheal intubation. A little bit like early versus late renal replacement therapy. Patients in the late renal replacement therapy group may not need renal replacement. Okay. But here, uh, when we speak about endotracheal intubation, we may also have a risk of cardiac arrest in the late endotracheal intubation group. Uh, in renal failure, things usually do not decompensate so quickly, but in respiratory failure, sometimes it can go bad quite rapidly, right? So I, I'm a bit concerned about such a uh, design for a prospective randomized controlled trial, right? What do you think? And what do the others think? No, well, I, I agree with uh, I agree with what you're saying, and I think it's definitely something that needs to be taken into account, especially given the pathophysiology of a disease. Yeah. The, the, so, yeah. No, the, please. Yeah, in our in our experience here in Pisa. We, uh, we also consider that when we put the tube in such a patient, as you told, uh, we have to, uh, to sustain the induction phase. And so it, it's not so easy because it's considered as a difficult intubation with your helm and, and that. But also we, in our experience, we have uh, realized that when you put the tube, the patient will remain tubed for at least uh, two, three weeks. And, and, and so uh, we have yeah. to see that if the, the, the patient can sustain such, a, 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 such a, an invasion for, for so long time. Because we decide to, to, to try also to not intubate all the old, uh, old people just because uh, uh, the first in, in intubation uh, uh, prolonged a very, very long ICU stay with uh, uh, myopathy and, 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 and so on. So we, we, we try to, to not intubate. On the other, on the other hand, it, it's true that if you last non-invasive ventilation, uh, uh, you, you may risk that when you put the tube, the patient has so a, is in a so bad condition that uh, it's too late uh, your, your treatment. So it, it, it's not easy again. Absolutely. We will continue during the main discussion probably is the right time now to speak about the potential problems uh, arising around the time of endotracheal intubation. And uh, Vincenzo Rossetto has done a very nice study with uh, Dr. Miatra and Dr. Lafay on, the, uh, on these uh, peri-intubation uh, problems. So it's the right time to invite Vincenzo to present his talk on airway management in tube study findings. Vincenzo. Thank you, and thank you for the invitation to this interesting webinar. Um, I have no conflict of interest for this talk. Um, so what is the rationale for a large observational study on, um, on uh, hardware management in critical care uh, we wanted to simply collect information on uh, head intubation types uh, of, of complications and uh, their incidence because until now, uh, the types and the uh, incidence of complication were available only from single center studies or from uh, national level studies, mainly for France and the uh, UK. So we are aware of the high risk of uh, pain intubation adverse events, but we wanted to measure uh, on a large scale what happens. So uh, this was the rationale behind the uh, in-tube study. So in uh, 2018, we launched an in-tube study and uh, a nice paper in uh, ICU management and practice also highlighted this. And uh, today, uh, after a few years, we are discussing the findings of Intube study. So Intube study was uh, uh, an international prospective observational study uh, that we completed um, in July 2019, um, uh, so before the pandemic, but uh, many information are also relevant for uh, COVID-19 patients. Uh, we uh, involved almost 200 uh, sites around the globe. And this is an important value of this study because for the first time we have a picture uh, 
of uh, many geographical areas and also different levels of care uh, on, uh, of, of critical care. And um, we collected information on adult critically ill patients undergoing consecutive uh, in-hospital intubation. And uh, we finally enrolled uh, approximately 3,000 patients undergoing uh, endotracheal intubation in critical care. Um, these are the major findings of our study. First of all, we had 45% uh, of pain intubation major adverse events. And this is uh, probably one of the most important information of this study. But more looking more deeply on uh, the type of major complication that we collected, we uh, observed that the leading pain intubation adverse event was cardiovascular instability observed in approximately 43% of patients and severe hypoxemia, which probably was perceived as the most common complication uh, is, uh, uh, was observed in 9% of patients. And we also had 3% uh, of uh, uh, cardiac arrest, which is a, a huge number if we consider also the high number of procedures that uh, each year are performed around the world. Uh, this is another important information. If you fail the first attempt of intubation, the risk of complication increases uh, uh, starting from the second attempt. And uh, this is uh, true for the overall complications, but also for the uh, cardiac arrest and severe hypoxemia. And in our, in, in our study, we had uh, approximately 80% of first pass success at intubation. And uh, this is an, also another important information that we had for the first time in a large prospective study that um, pain intubation adverse events may have an impact also on patient outcome because uh, patients suffering from for uh, pain intubation adverse events were at increased risk of both uh, ICU and 28 day mortality but also not, not only for the overall outcome, but also for the single outcome of cardiovascular instability. Cardiac arrest probably was the, the one most expected. But interestingly, patients suffering from a pet intubation, severe hypoxemia, that we define as an SpO2 below 80%, uh, were not associated with uh, an increased risk of dying at 28 days. For sure, this finding may be um, influenced by many confounders, uh, but we try to adjust for uh, uh, patient characteristics and baseline uh, uh, severity. And uh, even after adjustment for these variables, we still observe uh, an adjusted 28-day uh, mortality with an odds ratio of 1.44 in patients suffering from uh, pain intubation events compared to patients without events. Another important value also uh, comes from the observation of practice, because uh, this was another objective of this study, to see what people do around the globe. And um, focusing on, uh, on the topic of uh, today's webinar, pre-oxygenation methods, we are talking again before the COVID-19 pandemic, but the leading method, the most used methods to pre-oxygenate patients uh, today around the globe is uh, bag valve mask uh, used in more than 60% of patients, while other methods such as non-invasive ventilation, high flow nasal cannula, or even apneic oxygenation are seldom used uh, in real life. And if we look at the patient characteristics uh, here on the left, uh, the median PF ratio of our cohort was 160. So quite hypoxic population. And also uh, the reason for uh, intubation was uh, respiratory failure as a leading reason for intubation. Uh, so we, we registered the sort of discrepancy between uh, what the evidence suggests and what is uh, real life, because uh, we know from uh, recent trials that a uh, bag wolf mask or high flow nasal cannula may be uh, used in patients uh, with mild hypoxemia, so at, at low risk of uh, desaturation, while in patients with higher risk of uh, uh, desaturation during the procedure, which have a baseline moderate to severe uh, hypoxemia, we need to provide non-invasive ventilation uh, uh, to pre-oxygenate uh, safely our patients. And there is also an option in guidelines uh, in the extreme cases of uh, 
really uh, hypoxic patients uh, for awake intubation, which is uh, for sure a procedure that requires a really skilled operator. Um, I would uh, um, aspect, for example, the induction agent that has been used. It was really impressive for us to see that propofol and midazolam were the leading agent that has been used for induction of these patients, and this for sure may have influenced the high incidence of uh, cardiovascular collapse that we observed. Um, but what is what probably the most tricking observation comes from uh, the uh, observation of the monitoring that has been applied. Uh, if we look that only 25% of patients had wave foc apnography in place during the procedure, uh, that is a really impressive result. For sure, in the high CO, we observed a slightly higher use of capnography, uh, 40%, but it is still uh, really below what uh, is considered the standard of care. And also in the emergency department, 20% of patients were under capnography. Um, and we know from uh, this study, which is the National Audit Project 4, that has been published. 10 years ago, so this is an impressive result in, in light of these results, that the lack of capnography uh, 10 years ago contributed to more than 70% of uh, deaths uh, reported in that report. So in conclusion, major per intubation events are really common in critical patients, 45%. The hemodynamic collapse is the leading complication, so we should work more uh, on uh, hemodynamic optimization, both in, at the bedside, but also uh, in our research in order to identify which strategies may be effective to optimize uh, hemodynamics before uh, um, intubation. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. That's a very interesting uh, study, and it can also raise a number of questions and indeed, uh, if we can have all panel members on the screen, <clears throat> we have a number of uh, questions, and I must say, excellent questions. Uh, the first question uh, to the panel uh, returns to the oxygen, the, the risks of hyperoxemia, high uh, PaO2. Is it uh, only oxygen-free radicals, or is it something else? Perhaps Mark Leone first? Uh, I don't think it's uh, only uh, radical. Uh, these radicals are very uh, popular, but I think that there is a direct toxicity on, on, on the lung uh, with atelectasis, and atelectasis can, can generate infection and, and blah, blah, blah. Uh, there is a direct toxicity on the brain. There is a direct toxicity on vessels and on the, the, the hemodynamic response. So I, I do not think that the... the, the, the the generation of uh, ROS is the uh, only factor contributing to, to, to the multiple organ failure. Now, this, this brings an important point, I think. Exactly as we cannot confuse hypoxemia and hypoxia, uh, a high FiO2 is not necessarily the same as a high PaO2. So what are the specific risks of uh, a high PO2, let's say? That's my question. John, if you like, or someone uh, else? I think besides the ROS we are all talking about, we know as well that uh, oxygen antagonizes uh, nitric oxide and that cardiac perfusion decreases. And this is uh, maybe a reason for an increased rate of uh, myocardial infarction in patients receiving high doses of oxygen, um, maybe perioperatively, or it has been shown in the AVOID study that uh, those patients receiving oxygen have a higher uh, creatinine kinase release uh, than patients receiving titrated oxygen. So um, besides, well, to be honest, we don't know uh, all those effects, a uh, high uh, 
PO2 uh, does, but we see clinically that these patients um, have a worse outcome. And um, there, are, there are even retrospective data pointing towards a uh, time dose relationship that patients receiving oxygen for uh, longer uh, periods of time, high oxygen for longer periods of time, yeah. have a, um, a worse outcome. And uh, we have uh, data in our own institution. We are just um, evaluating that that points to a, a worse outcome in those patients that have a that have higher oxygen integrals per time. So, if you have a ventilated patient and uh, you take the oxygen integrals above a certain threshold, then this seems to um, to increase uh, mortality and morbidity. That's a very important point. Uh, the time is also crucial. Having hyperoxia for a very short period of time may not be very, very toxic, but if you don't pay attention to it, and if you leave the patient with a high PAO2, that may be problematic. And, and, and Mark, you indicated, I think it would be nice to repeat it, that a high PAO2 can alter the hemodynamics and the microcirculation in particular, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah, uh, that's an, an inhibitor of uh, NO, and, and you can have a strong vasoconstriction with high uh, PAO2. So you, you should be careful with that, yes. Someone is asking, um, what is the organ which is the most sensitive to a high PAO2? Is it the brain? Is it the heart? Is it uh, another organ? or do all organs potentially suffer um, in the same way? I would say it's typical a multiple organ failure. Uh, perhaps the, the lungs seems to be, to be the first target uh, due to its, its role, but uh, I would say that typically, uh, that's typically a silent killer uh, affecting uh, all organs. Yeah, John, do you agree? Because many studies have been done after cardiac arrest in, um, you know, in patients with a brain insult in a, in a large, uh, yeah. in a broad sense. I think probably the most sensitive organ is the organ at risk. So if we have a patient yeah. uh, coming with brain injury, then the brain is at risk. And if we have a patient in, with a, a primary ARDS, then the lung is at risk and so on. So uh, probably you have to look at the um, specific uh, disease your patient is currently suffering from. Yeah, sure. Uh, the, the, there will be questions to Francesco and uh, uh, Vincenzo, but the um, a question to all panel members is, would you have different PO2 targets in various conditions? Uh, in ALDS, after a cardiac arrest, uh, in COVID-19, um, and I'll keep the question of preterm uh, babies uh, for later. But let's first speak about adult populations. Do we have different targets? Well, this is a question that is uh, hard to answer because uh, what uh, Mark presented is that we currently are basically comparing uh, normal values with other normal values. And we are trying to find the optimum uh, oxygen target. And um, the reason that we currently have different recommendations for different diseases, as I uh, showed in the, in the table at the end of my presentation, is that the studies were designed a certain way. But um, probably um, those targets could be unified, but we are we do not have uh, sufficient data for this to support this. Okay. But uh, probably the physiology or pathophysiology of oxygen is uh, similar in 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 different diseases. Yep. So we okay. probably what I showed we need two targets: uh, one uh, risk of hypercarbia and one without. Okay. Vincenzo, Francesco, would you like to comment on this question? No? Yes, I agree that uh, it, it is the... Uh, uh, um, yeah, I, I agree that it is difficult to provide an absolute threshold for 
for all patients. And um, yeah, I agree with uh, you on, on, uh, on, on this topic. Yeah, so uh, there are a number of questions about the optimal time to intubate the um, trachea and perhaps Vincenzo could, uh, could take over. Um, you know, when we speak about going from uh, high frequency nasal oxygen to CPAP, the NIV, is it the usual progression or uh, what would be your strategy? Well, in, in, our, in our practice, we look also uh, on the respiratory mechanics of our patients. This is not about, uh, um, about of, uh, FeO2 or uh, of uh, saturation. We look at uh, respiratory mechanics probably also as the first point. So if we have, uh, for sure, if we have an escalation of uh, oxygen requirement in, in the first day, probably... Uh, we we put uh, uh, an alert for that patients and we we in, we probably increase the monitoring of that patient, uh, but probably yeah it, it, at, the, at at the same level of oxygenation probably the the, the major point is uh, is uh, the respiratory mechanics because probably the counterpart of uh, delaying intubation is what cannot be seen that is uh, the self-inflicted self lung injury that cannot be measured at the bedside today. And uh, this is probably what um, should be also considered in the choice. Yeah. Um, Francesco, there are a number of uh, questions about COVID-19. Uh, would you do this? Would you do that? When would you start this? Uh, I will group all these questions in one. Uh, what are the specifics? of the, the specific aspect of COVID-19 associated respiratory failure. Um, what is peculiar uh, or alternatively, could we apply the same management as in other patients with other forms of respiratory failure? Uh, okay, it's, it, it's not an easy question. Uh, uh, I, I think that uh, in, in the probably in the first phase of disease, we have to consider that uh, the hypoxemia may be related to uh, ventilatory perfusion mismatching. Yeah. The, to the uh, starting of uh, microthrombi in the in the alveoli in the in the, the small vessel around yeah. alveoli. So. Uh, uh, we can try to reverse this, uh, this uh, condition, giving more oxygen. This is why uh, usual first step uh, in, in treating this disease is to give, uh, uh, to, to rise FeO2. Uh, when disease progress, uh, th th there is a, a severe inflammation of the, of the lungs. How is it different from other forms of respiratory failure? That's, that's the question. Because you could have it, uh, in uh, you know, in other forms of severe community acquired pneumonia, for instance, in the first phases of disease, probably the lung compliance is still preserved. So yeah. uh, uh, you you don't need to apply uh, uh, important uh, uh, people or uh, uh, because the, the lung is uh, is still easily uh, inflatable. Is yeah, that, yeah, 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 compliant. Okay, compliant. Is, when, when the disease progress, probably uh, it, it becomes very, very closer to other form or a, a, a ARDS. I, I think that the main difference is in the first phase of, of, of disease, where you have yeah. a, 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 quite, a, a quite normal lung despite a severe hypoxemia. This, yeah. this, this is probably the, the, the main difference. Do the others feel the same? Any other comment about about it, Mark? 
Yes, I, uh, I have the same feeling. Uh, during the first wave in, in, in my unit, we, we intubate very early the patient because we, we had this kind of recommendation coming from, from outside. Uh, you had, to, you had to, to intubate early. And during the second wave, we, we, we intubate uh, in normal time uh, when there is some, some, some trouble on, in mechanics. Uh, uh, like Vincenzo, uh, and uh, the the number of patients intubated was very uh, decreased in the second wave, yeah. and, and and the the duration of ICU stay was, was decreased in the second wave. So I really think we 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 have to to intubate them based on mechanics, uh, on clinical assessment, and uh, and not only on numbers. So. Uh, are you proposing that we should look at the degree of hypoxemia, but also the work of breathing of the patient, the degree of respiratory distress? Vincenzo, yes. would you agree with that? Yes, uh, respiratory frequency, but also the toracoabdominal dyssynchronies uh, and also the patient's self-perception of, uh, of the work of breathing. Because sometimes, as we know, in COVID-19, there is what we call the silent hypoxemia. Some patients look relatively well, despite the very severe alteration in blood gases, right? Yeah, yeah. another, another information probably also comes from the chest X-ray, if available, or, uh, or uh, yeah, if we have a, a white X-ray, this is also... As you say, probably young people can tolerate uh, a high workload, but we already see on, uh, on the image the, the, the consequences of uh, uh, prolonged work of breathing. Yeah, I, I realize that we skipped the question on optimal PO2 in preterm infants. Uh, in the past, we were very concerned about hyperoxia in, uh, in, uh, in neonates uh, and, uh, and newborns. Um, is it still the case? Who would like to take the question? Jan, no? Nobody? We do not have pediatricians in the group, I suspect. And uh, uh, we, it's, it's a very particular question for a neonatologist. But uh, um, Jan, we would like to have uh, uh, your thoughts on uh, on a very simple question, but someone is telling us that we have not addressed it properly. When to start and when to stop oxygen administration? Perhaps we are giving too much oxygen to our patients in the hospital. Should we do something about it and uh, think a bit more before starting and before stopping uh, oxygen? Young? Yes, definitely. Um, uh, I think Fra Francesco uh, said uh, oxygen is a drug, and I completely agree with that. And uh, we need an indication uh, to apply or administer a drug to our patients. So uh, we do not um, administer oxygen if uh, the patient is not um, hypoxemic, and we stop it um, if the oxygen saturation is above the targeted limit. So um, I think you really have to treat oxygen as a drug and um, well in the past oxygen was just um, well the nurse just uh, uh, opened uh, the, the oxygen bottle and the patient received oxygen and no one really cared but this is something we have to uh, to target and to, to teach that oxygen uh, may do harm and um, I think we, we have to think more about oxygen as a drug uh, to uh, to reduce its administration to our patients. If it's needed, hypoxemia is, is bad as well. So um, uh, apply oxygen, but uh, do not give oxygen just because you always did. So I think yeah. this is a point with a lot of, of teaching necessary in the, in the hospital, not only on intensive care. You go to the emergency department and you visit a patient. You maybe have to transfer to, to ICU and uh, he's, he's awake, oxygen saturation, 100%, and he receives six liters of oxygen. Uh, so yeah. this is not, not correct. Yeah, right. Absolutely. Yes. 
We are reaching the end of our conversation here, but perhaps one, uh, one last question, and perhaps you will have last comments or questions, but the, uh, there is a question regarding the duration of high flow oxygen therapy. Could we keep it for very long, or should we be concerned about potentially the risk of uh, lung trauma? Uh, Mark or Francesco or Vincenzo? I, I don't have any data on that, but but in my in my opinion, but that's really personal, which which should not be uh, done is to have high uh, PAO2 and high saturation. Uh, uh, if the patient needs oxygen, I think they can receive oxygen for 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 the time we need. Uh, that should be personalized. But uh, but uh, if the indication is good, uh, there is no restriction in time. Uh, that, that's my opinion. But and I don't think there is so, so much data on that. Yeah. Thank you. Any last uh, question or comment from? Uh... A panel member. If not, I think we will bring this meeting to a close. I think we had very interesting discussions and of course we can find much more in the publications in ICU management and practice. But we discussed very much the fact that oxygen is indeed like a drug and of course not enough oxygen can be bad for the organs but too much oxygen can also be bad, especially when there is severe hyperoxemia or hyperoxia, high PO2, uh, that could have deleterious effects on the organs. As uh, Mark said, uh, in the nature, hyperoxemia does not exist. Uh, even when you go down below uh, the, uh, the sea level, uh, you cannot have a very high IPO too, so the nature doesn't know it. <laughs> so many thanks to all of you, and uh, I think we had um, good discussions. And uh, take care, and we'll see you later. Bye bye.